Welcome to a half hour of Mind Webs. Short stories from the worlds of speculative fiction. Today's story is Norman Spinrad's Carcinoma Angels, which appeared in Dangerous Visions, edited by Harlan Ellison. At the age of eight, Harrison Wintergreen first discovered that the world was his oyster when he looked at it sideways. That was the year when baseball cards were in. The kid with the biggest collection of baseball cards was it. Harry Wintergreen decided to become it. Harry saved up a dollar and bought 100 random baseball cards. He was in luck. One of them was a very rare Yogi Berra. In three separate transactions, he traded his other 99 cards for the only other three Yogi Berras in the neighborhood. Harry had reduced his holdings to four cards, but he had cornered the market in Yogi Berra. He forced the price of Yogi Berra up to an exorbitant 80 cards. And with his lush fund thus accumulated, he successfully cornered the market in Mickey Mantle, Willie Mays, and Pee Wee Reese. And he became the J.P. Morgan of baseball cards. Harry breezed through high school by the simple expedient of mastering only one subject, the art of taking tests. By his senior year, he could outthink any test writer with his jip sheet tied behind his back and won seven scholarships with foolish ease. In college, Harry discovered girls. Being reasonably good-looking and reasonably facile, he no doubt would have garnered his fair share of conquests in the normal course of events, but this was not the way the mind of Harrison Wintergreen worked. Harry cultivated a stutter, which he could turn on or off at will. Few girls could resist the lure of a good-looking, well-adjusted guy with a slick line, who nevertheless carried with him some inner secret hurt that made him stutter. Many were the girls who tried to delve Harry's secret, while Harry delved them. In his sophomore year, Harry grew bored with college and reasoned that the thing to do was become filthy rich. He assiduously studied sex novels for one month, wrote three of them in the next two, which he immediately sold at $1,000 a throw. With the $3,000 thus garnered, he bought a shiny new convertible. He drove the new car to the Mexican border and across into a notorious border town. He immediately contacted a disreputable shoeshine boy and bought a pound of marijuana. The shoeshine boy, of course, tipped off the border guards, and when Harry attempted to walk across the bridge to the States, they stripped him naked. They found nothing, and Harry crossed the border. He had smuggled nothing out of Mexico, and in fact had thrown the marijuana away as soon as he bought it. However, he had taken advantage of the Mexican embargo on American cars, and illegally sold the convertible in Mexico for $15,000. Harry took his $15,000 to Las Vegas, and spent the next six weeks buying people drinks, lending broke gamblers money, acting in general like a fuzzy-cheeked Santa Claus, gaining the confidence of the right drunks, and blowing $5,000. At the end of six weeks, he had three hot market tips, which turned his remaining $10,000 into $40,000 in the next two months. Harry bought 400 crated government surplus Jeeps in 400 Jeep lots at $10,000 a lot, and immediately sold them to a highly disreputable Central American government for $100,000. He took the $100,000 and bought a tiny island in the Pacific, so worthless that no government had ever bothered to claim it. He set himself up as an independent government with no taxes and sold 21-acre plots to 20 millionaires seeking a tax haven at $100,000 a plot. He unloaded the last plot three weeks before the United States, with UN backing, claimed the island and brought it under the sway of the Internal Revenue Department. Harry invested a small part of his $2 million and rented a large computer for 12 hours. The computer constructed a betting scheme by which Harry parlayed his $2 million into $20 million by taking various British soccer pools to the tune of $18 million. For $5 million, he bought a monstrous chunk of useless desert from an impoverished Arabian sultanate. With another $2 million, he created a huge rumor campaign to the effect that this patch of desert was literally floating on oil. 
With another three million, he set up a dummy corporation which made like a big oil company and publicly offered to buy his desert for 75 million. After some spirited bargaining, a large American oil company was allowed to outbid the dummy and bought a thousand square miles of sand for 100 million dollars. Harrison Wintergreen was, at the age of 25, filthy rich by his own standards. He lost his interest in money. He now decided that he wanted to do good. He did good. He toppled seven unpleasant Latin American governments and replaced them with six social democracies and a benevolent dictatorship. He converted a tribe of Borneo headhunters to Rosicrucianism. He set up 12 rest homes for overage whores and organized a birth control program which sterilized 12 million fecund Indian women. He contrived to make another $100 million on the above enterprises. At the age of 30, Harrison Wintergreen had had it with do-gooding. He decided to leave his footprints in the sands of time. He left his footprints in the sand of time. He wrote an internationally acclaimed novel about King Farouk. He invented the winter green filter, a membrane through which fresh water passed freely, but which barred salts. Once set up, a winter green desalinization plant could desalinate an unlimited supply of water at a per gallon cost that approached absolute zero. He painted one painting and was instantly offered $200,000 for it. He donated it to the Museum of Modern Art. He developed a mutated virus which destroyed syphilis bacteria. Like syphilis, it spread by sexual contact. It was a mild aphrodisiac. Syphilis was wiped out in 18 months. He bought an island off the coast of California, a 500-foot crag jutting out of the Pacific. He caused it to be carved into a 500-foot statue of Harrison Wintergreen. At the age of 38, Harrison Wintergreen had left sufficient footprints in the sands of time. He was bored. He looked around greedily for new worlds to conquer. This, then, was the man who, at the age of 40, was informed that he had an advanced, well-spread, and incurable case of cancer, and that he had one year to live. Wintergreen spent the first month of his last year searching for an existing cure for terminal cancer. He visited laboratories, medical schools, hospitals, clinics, great doctors, quacks, people who had miraculously recovered from cancer, faith healers, and little old ladies in tennis shoes. There was no known cure for terminal cancer, reputable or otherwise. It was, as he suspected, as he more or less even hoped, he would have to do it himself. He proceeded to spend the next month setting things up to do it himself. He caused to be erected in the middle of the Arizona desert an air-conditioned walled villa. The villa had a completely automatic kitchen and enough food for a year. It had a $5 million biological and biochemical laboratory. It had a $3 million microfilm library which contained every word ever written on the subject of cancer. It had the pharmacy to end all pharmacies, a liberal supply of quite literally every drug that existed poisons, painkillers, hallucinogens, dandricides, antiseptics, antibiotics, headache remedies, heroin, quinine, curare, snake oil, everything. The pharmacy cost $20 million. The villa also contained a one-way radio telephone, a large stock of basic chemicals, including radioactives, copies of the Koran, the Bible, the Torah, the Book of the Dead, science and health with key to the scriptures, the I Ching, and the complete works of Wilhelm Reich and Aldous Huxley. It also contained a very large and ultra-expensive computer. By the time the villa was ready, Wintergreen's petty cash fund was nearly exhausted. With ten months to do that which the medical world considered impossible, Harrison Wintergreen entered his citadel. During the first two months, he devoured the library, sleeping three hours out of every 24 and dosing himself regularly with Benzedrine. The library offered nothing but data. He digested the data and went on to the pharmacy. During the next month, 
He tried oreomycin, bacitracin, stannous fluoride, hexyl, resorcinol, cortisone, penicillin, hexachlorophene, shark liver extract, and 7,312 assorted other miracles of modern medical science, all to no avail. He began to feel pain, which he immediately blotted out and continued to blot out with morphine. Morphine addiction was merely an annoyance. He tried chemicals, radioactives, Christian science, yoga, prayer, enemas, patent medicines, herb tea, witchcraft, and yogurt diets. This consumed another month, during which Wintergreen continued to waste away, sleeping less and less and taking more and more Benzedrine and morphine. Nothing worked. He had six months left. He was on the verge of becoming desperate. He tried a different tack. He sat in a comfortable chair and contemplated his navel for 48 consecutive hours. His meditations produced a severe case of eye strain and two significant words, spontaneous remission. In his two months of research, Wintergreen had come upon numbers of cases where a terminal cancer abruptly reversed itself and the patient, for whom all hope had been abandoned, had been cured. No one ever knew how or why. It could not be predicted, it could not be artificially produced, but it happened nevertheless. For want of an explanation, they called it spontaneous remission. Remission meaning cure, spontaneous meaning no one knew what caused it. Which was not to say that it did not have a cause. Wintergreen was buoyed. He was even ebullient. He knew that some terminal cancer patients had been cured. Therefore, terminal cancer could be cured. Therefore, the problem was removed from the realm of the impossible. It was now merely the domain of the highly improbable. And doing the highly improbable was Wintergreen's specialty. With six months of estimated life left, Wintergreen set jubilantly to work. From his complete cancer library, he called every known case of spontaneous remission. He coded every one of them into the computer. Data on the medical histories of the patients, on the treatments employed, on their ages, sexes, religions, races, creeds, colors, national origins, temperaments, marital status, Dun and Bradstreet ratings, neuroses, psychoses, and favorite beers. Complete profiles of every human being ever known to have survived terminal cancer were fed into Harrison Wintergreen's computer. Wintergreen programmed the computer to run a complete series of correlations between 10,000 separate and distinct factors and spontaneous remission. If even one factor, age, credit rating, favorite food, anything, correlated with spontaneous remission, the spontaneity factor would be removed. Wintergreen had shelled out $100 million for the computer. It was the best damn computer in the world. In two minutes and 7.894 seconds, it had performed its task. In one succinct word, it gave Wintergreen his answer. Negative. Spontaneous remission did not correlate with any external factor. It was still spontaneous. The cause was unknown. A lesser man would have been crushed. A more conventional man would have been dumbfounded. Harrison Wintergreen was elated he had eliminated the entire external universe as a factor in spontaneous remission in one fell swoop. Therefore, in some mysterious way, the human body and or psyche was capable of curing itself. Wintergreen set out to explore and conquer his own internal universe. He repaired to the pharmacy and prepared a formidable potation. Into his largest syringe, he decanted the following. Novocaine. Morphine, curare, vlute, a rare Central Asian poison which induced temporary blindness, olfactor cane, a top-secret smell deadener used by skunk farmers, tympanoline, a drug which temporarily deadened the auditory nerves used primarily by filibustering senators, a large dose of benzedrine, lysergic acid, psilocybin, mescaline, peyote extract, seven other highly experimental and most illegal hallucinogens, eye of newt, and toe of dog. Wintergreen laid himself out on his most comfortable couch. He swabbed the vein in the pit of his left elbow with alcohol and injected himself with a witch's brew. His heart pumped, his blood surged, carrying the arcane chemicals to every part of his body. The Novocaine blanked out every sensory nerve in his body. The morphine eliminated all sensations of pain. The vlute blacked out his vision. The olfactor cane cut off all sense of smell. 
The tympanolene made him deaf as a traffic court judge. The Kirari paralyzed him. Wintergreen was alone in his own body. No external stimuli reached him. He was in a state of total sensory deprivation. The urge to lapse into blessed unconsciousness was irresistible. Wintergreen, strong will though he was, could not have remained conscious unaided. But the massive dose of benzedrine would not let him sleep. He was awake, aware, alone in the universe of his own body with no external stimuli to occupy himself with. And then one and two, and then in combinations like the fists of a good, fast heavyweight, the hallucinogens hit. Wintergreen's sensory organs were blanked out, but the brain centers which receive sensory data were still active. It was on these cerebral centers that the tremendous charge of assorted hallucinogens acted. He began to see phantom colors, shapes, things without name or form. He heard eldritch symphonies, ghost echoes, mad howling noises. A million impossible smells roiled through his brain. A thousand false pains and pressures tore at him as if his whole body had been amputated. The sensory centers of Wintergreen's brain were like a mighty radio receiver tuned to an empty band filled with meaningless visual, auditory, olfactory, and sensual static. The drugs kept his sense blank. The benzedrine kept him conscious. Forty years of being Harrison Wintergreen kept him cold and sane. For an indeterminate period of time, he rolled with the punches, groping for the feel of this strange new non-environment. Then gradually, hesitantly at first, but with ever-growing confidence, Wintergreen reached for control. His mind constructed untrue but useful analogies for actions that were not actions, states of being that were not states of being, sensory data unlike any sensory data received by the human brain. The analogies constructed in a kind of calculated madness by his subconscious for the brute task of making the incomprehensible palpable, also enabled him to deal with his non-environment as if it were an environment, translating mental changes into analogs of action. He reached out an analogical hand and tuned a figurative radio inward away from the blank wave band of the outside universe and towards the as yet unused wave band of his own body, the internal universe that was his mind's only possible escape from chaos. He tuned, adjusted, forced, struggled, felt his mind pressing against an atom-thin interface. He battered against the interface an analogical translucent membrane between his mind and his internal universe, a membrane that stretched, flexed, bulged inward, thinned, and finally broke. Like Alice through the looking glass, his analogical body stepped through and stood on the other side. Harrison Wintergreen was inside his own body. It was a world of wonder and loathsomeness, of the majestic and the ludicrous. Wintergreen's point of view, which his mind analogized as a body within his true body, was inside a vast network of pulsing arteries like some monstrous freeway system. The analogy crystallized. It was a freeway, and Wintergreen was driving down it. Bloated sacks dumped things into the teeming traffic. Hormones, wastes, nutrients. White blood cells careened by him like mad taxi cabs. Red corpuscles drove steadily along like stolid burgers. The traffic ebbed and congested like a crosstown rush hour. Wintergreen drove on, searching, searching. He made a left, cut across three lanes, and made a right down toward a lymph node. And then he saw it, a pile of white cells like a 12-car collision, and speeding towards him, a leering motorcyclist. Black the cycle, black the riding leathers, black, dull black the face of the rider, save for two glowing blood-red eyes and emblazoned across the front and the back of the black motorcycle jacket and shining scarlet studs the legend Carcinoma Angels. With a savage whoop, Wintergreen gunned his analogical car down the hypothetical freeway straight for the imaginary cyclist, the cancer cell. Splat! Pop! Crush! 
and Winterdwing's car smashed the cycle, and the rider exploded in a cloud of fine black dust. Up and down the freeways of his circulatory system, Wintergreen ranged, barreling along arteries, careening down veins, inching through narrow capillaries, seeking the black-clad cyclists, the carcinoma angels, grinding them to dust beneath his wheels. And he found himself in the dark, moist wood of his lungs, riding a snow-white analogical horse, an imaginary lance of pure light in his hand. Savage black dragons with blood-red eyes and flickering red tongues slithered from behind the gnarled balls of great air sac trees. St. Wintergreen spurred his horse, lowered his lance, and impaled monster after hissing monster, till at last the holy longwood was free of dragons. He was flying in some vast, moist cavern. Above him, the vague bulks of gigantic organs below a limitless expanse of shining, slimy, peritoneal plain. From behind the cover of his huge, beating heart, a formation of black fighter planes bearing the insignia of a scarlet sea on their wings and fuselages roared down at him. Wintergreen gunned his engine and rose to the fray, flying up and over the bandits, blasting them with his machine guns. And one by one, and then in bunches, they crashed in flames to the peritoneum below. In a thousand shapes and guises, the black and red things attacked. Black, the color of oblivion, red, the color of blood. Dragons, cyclists, planes, sea things, soldiers, tanks and tigers in blood vessels and lungs and spleen and thorax and bladder, carcinoma angels all. And Wintergreen fought his analogical battles in an equal number of incarnations as driver, knight, pilot, diver, soldier, and with a grim and savage glee, littering the battlefields of his body with the black dust of the fallen carcinoma angels fought and fought and killed and killed and finally, finally, found himself knee-deep in the sea of his digestive juices lapping against the walls of the dank, moist cave that was his stomach. And scuttling towards him on chitinous legs, a monstrous black crab with blood-red eyes, gross, squat, primeval, clicking and clittering, the crab scurried across his stomach towards him. Wintergreen paused, grinned wolfishly, and leaped high in the air, landing with both feet squarely on the hard black carapace. Like a sun-dried gourd, brittle, dry, hollow, the crab crunched beneath his weight and splintered into a million dusty fragments. And Wintergreen was alone. At last alone and victorious, the first and last of the carcinoma angels, now banished and gone and finally defeated. Harrison Wintergreen, alone in his own body, victorious, and once again looking for new worlds to conquer, waiting for the drugs to wear off, waiting to return to the world that always was his oyster, waiting and waiting and waiting. Go to the finest sanitarium in the world, and there you will find Harrison Wintergreen, who made himself filthy rich. Harrison Wintergreen, who did good. Harrison Wintergreen, who left his footprints in the sands of time. Harrison Wintergreen, catatonic vegetable. Harrison Wintergreen, who stepped inside his own body to do battle with carcinoma's angels, and won, and can't get out.
You've heard Carcinoma Angels, written by Norman Spinrad. The story first appeared in the book Dangerous Visions, which was edited by Harlan Ellison. This is Michael Hansen speaking. Our engineer was Steve Gordon. Mind Webs is a production of WHA Radio in Madison, service of University of Wisconsin Extension. Thank you.